If you're already at Luke chapter 7, I uh, encourage you to stay there. If you're not there, please turn there. In just a few moments, we're going to spend a lot of our time in Luke chapter 7. Appreciate the reading of scripture that was done in verses 36, 39. That helps me get on into my lesson. So thankful for the people that are here this, uh, this afternoon. And we're so th- appreciative of your spirituality, your desire to be pleasing to the Lord, your desire to be apart and be together with your spiritual family. It's a tribute to, to you, the Lord's pleased, and your bro- fellow brother and sister in Christ are pleased. So good to have everyone here. Appreciate uh, the prayer that was uttered by Wes, and we're so thankful for the, our brother who led us in singing, and what good singing you have here. I, I mean, when you have good singing like that, it just fires me up to do a better job in the preaching and teaching of gospel. All preachers will tell you that, that it's a very big advantage when you have good singing before you preach. Look at Luke chapter 7 and verse 34. We have the Pharisees saying, and let's start in verse 33. It says, For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say he has a demon. You know, we read that and we're just fascinated how somebody could come to the conclusion. Now, John was eccentric, but he was a very, very plain-spoken messenger of the truth of God. And, and his message was simple. Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he did call the, the Pharisees a brood of vipers. Uh, I don't know in this day and time could we get away with calling a group of people. You're just a brood of uh, snakes, vipers. But they say he has a demon. And then in verse 34, the son of man has come eating and drinking. And you say, look, a glutton and wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Now, interestingly enough, half of that is true. The, one, the th- part that is untrue, th- this idea of being a glutton and a wine bibber, but Jesus was a friend to not only tax collectors and sinners, but also he was a friend to the Pharisees. If they had receptive hearts willing to obey the gospel and hear his message. So Jesus declares that this generation views him as being, notice, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And the tax collectors, the Jews, despised. They considered them reprobates. And this attitude of the Jews is not uncommon in Jesus' ministry. Look at, at Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 1. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, very familiar story to us, There was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief, notice a chief tax collector, and he was rich and he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not for the crowd because he was short, he was of short stature. Now, we had a summer series and our summer series was minor characters of the New Testament with major lessons. And... Tristan Gancherrell, the young preacher I worked with, and Tyler, we had, we had to decide who was going to pick Zacchaeus. And, of course, uh, the one we picked, you know what they said. Are y'all calling me short? <laughs> but he was short in stature. So what did he do? Now, first of all, he's described as a chief tax collector, short in stature, verse 4, And he ran ahead and climbed up in a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. Jesus had that effect on people. He was going to see the Lord. He would not be able to see the Lord unless he was in the sycamore tree, so that's what he did. He climbed up it. In verse 5, and when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, now notice, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I will stay at your house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying, He has gone to be a guest with the man who is a sinner. 
And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore to him fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because he is also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. So this attitude is not uncommon in regard to the Pharisees, how they viewed other people. See, Zacchaeus is a chief collector of, ta- of the tax collectors, and that meant he uh, not only collected taxes from the Romans, but he was over those who collected taxes. And the reason the Jews hated tax collectors so much, many would tax to make a profit. They had ch- uh, charged a certain a- amount above what the Romans woman wanted to get a high profit. But we do find that Zacchaeus is a prominent wealthy man. But we see he's an honest tax collector who gives half of his goods to the poor. And Jesus tells Zacchaeus that he will be going to his house that very day. And how does Zacchaeus react? He reacts with pure joy. And that's how we need to react. When we go to the word of God and we read this divine message from heaven, It should be a joyful thing to study God's word and be able to hear the truths that come from God to tell us how we need to live, how we need to be saved, and how we ultimately need to go to heaven. And you see, Jesus was not seeking to stay in the finest home in Jericho or in some way show preference to this man of wealth. What was he doing? He was reaching out to a publican, that others viewed as a sinner who had humbled himself and wanted to make more of himself. And the gospel is like that. It includes those who don't seem to be, to others, good candidates of the gospel. This is Jesus seeking and saving that which is lost. How did the Jews respond? We read it. And when they saw it, They all murmured, saying, he's gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. How do we view people? How do we look at people? When they they look at our eyes, when they look at our eyes, when we come up to them and we greet them, do, do they see a person that loves their soul? I was here when Sam preached that lesson. He said, I was wondering who the guy was that was saying amen in that corner over there. And I didn't get to talk to him because Michelle had had given us a previous engagement after the service. But do all people, when they see us, do they see us as people that love their soul? that we're genuinely interested in them. Is that what they see in our eyes? Do they they see someone that will look at their best interests without expecting anything in return? Is that that what they see? Not only by what they see in our eyes, but by our actions. Do we love all people? Are we interested in the souls of all people like Jesus? But they said he has gone to be a guest with a man who's a sinner. And then the other example is in Luke chapter 5. And this, this is a little bit shorter section. In Luke chapter 5, let's pick up reading at verse 27. And after these things... Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi, we know as Matthew, sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. Now keep in mind, this is a guy that probably had great wealth too. Jesus said, follow me. What did he do? He left his office and followed him at that moment. And he left all, rose up and followed him, and Levi gave him a great feast in his own house, And there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with them. 
And their scribes and the Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered and said to them, Those who are well do not need a physician, but those that are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. What's sad to me when I read this text is that the scribes and the Pharisees, they view themselves as spiritually healthy. But in reality, they are spiritually sick, just like the publicans and sinners they condemn. The truth of the matter is, is that all in Matthew's house need the great physician. All of them need salvation. And that is the very reason Jesus tells Zacchaeus today salvation has come to this house. The source of salvation has truly come to the house. And Zacchaeus is ready to do the works worthy of a repentance. And the result of this is a different way of living for a good man. And we note that in Matthew's house, Jesus says, I have come to call the righteous, not sinners, to repentance. So ladies and gentlemen, it's in this Pharisaic atmosphere that Jesus does the unexpected and accepts the invitation not of a tax collector or a sinner, but he accepts the invitation of a Pharisee to eat a meal at his house. And if you think about it, it's shocking because it doesn't happen often. But, but the truth of the matter is, is that Jesus knows that both need him. That both need reformation. And both groups need salvation. And making oneself available to, to spend time with others and treating them with kindness does not necessarily imply Agreement with their spiritual conditions or, or the conclusions. Barclay adds the scene in the courtyard of the house of Simon the Pharisee is very vivid. The houses of well-to-do people were built around an open courtyard in the, fo- in the, in the form of a hollow square. And often in the courtyard there would be a garden and a fountain. And there in the warm weather, meals were eaten. It was the custom that when a rabbi was at a meal in such a house, all kinds of people came in. They were quite free to do so, to listen to the pearls of wisdom which fell from his lips. And that explains the presence of the woman. Well... You, you got me? Okay, good. So that leads me to this point. Jesus draws sinners. In Luke chapter 7, going back, to, going to verses 37 and 38, notice with me. And behold, a woman in the city was a sinner. When she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil, And stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears. And wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet. And anointed them with the fragrant oil. It is obvious from this uh, section of text. That word got out about Jesus being there. It's very obvious. And not only that, that he was going to be in the, in the house of Simon the Pharisee because the woman knows he's there and that he's reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house. And typically the reclining was all of them sitting down and leaning toward each other. It seems the, the feet of Jesus were on the back, on the back side of where he was laying for what happens next in the story. But this woman is determined 
to get to Jesus, even if it means going to a Pharisee's house, whom she knew despised her. Caldwell adds, this strict Pharisee would not have chosen to personally invite a sinful woman. Uninvited neighbors were apparently sometimes allowed in their culture to come and sit around the wall to share the presence of an honored guest, even though they would not be invited to join in the meal. But whatever the case, this woman works her way into Simon's house right to the foot of Jesus, and she brings with her an alabaster flask of fragrant oil. And this alabaster flask is probably made of a marble like gypsum rock, and the oil is most likely an expensive perfume. And it was the custom of the time for the guests to remove the sandals before the meal and recline on the left elbow or side with the feet outward from the table, as I mentioned earlier. And with that in mind, the woman is standing at the feet of Jesus weeping. And this woman is, is probably weeping with joy that she's at the feet of Jesus and, and at the, also at the sinful life, shame of the sin, sinful life she lives. She is crying so profusely that her tears wet the unwashed feet of Jesus she then kneels and washes his Jesus' feet with her hair, kisses his feet, and anoints his feet with the fragrant perfume she brought. Now some people, they wonder, how did she get to the feet of Jesus in this Pharisee's house when there's this great crowd? And all I could think of is when I coached uh, cross country. And I had a, had a young lady named Becca Bridge. She was the best female athlete I ever coached. And when she was a freshman, she, she was timid. And she, she, had, she asked me, Coach, I, I'm starting behind because I can't get to the front of the line. And she said, how can I get to the front of the line? And I said, well, you do it nicely. Now, if you tried to push your way to the front of the line, it wouldn't go well. So I said, you got to do it nicely. And she said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, I, I said, I'll illustrate. Just come up and say, excuse me. Uh, excuse me. Oh, excuse me. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. And then the next thing you know, you're going to be at the front of the line. And so the next cross-country uh, tournament we were in, run we were in, I watch her, and she, she not only does it, but she just takes her team with us. And I could see her talking to the people, and I could imagine she was going, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. So I think it's something like that. But what it shows is determination to get at the feet of Jesus. She's not going to let anything stand in her way from doing what she felt like she needed to do to the master. One author adds, she wept so much that she wet, wet his feet with her tears. And in order to wipe his feet, she let her hair down in public, something regarded as shameful. She was in a grip of her emotions and oblivious to what others thought. And we need to do a better job of that. Why are we worried about what the people of the world think of us? God's interested in our character. We need to be interested in what God thinks of us, not what others of the world think of us. She was in the grip of her emotions and oblivious to what others thought. She did not stop kissing his feet out of deep reverence. Then she poured rare and expensive perfume, normally reserved for the head, on his feet. She loved Jesus with all her heart. And I don't think anyone would argue with this point that this woman's act was an act of courage and humility and love and devo devotion and reverence for the Lord. And like Jesus, this woman has no concern for the criticism which will come with such an act of service and love. Because we know she's going to get criticism. She knew she was going to get criticism. 
And that leads me to the next point. Jesus cares for sinners. Notice Luke 7, starting in verse 39. And when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what this man or woman have known who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he said, teacher said, there was a certain creditor who had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave, forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have judged, rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. And you did not anoint my head with oil. But this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Ironically, the host criticizes Jesus more than he does the simple woman. Jesus knew his thoughts. So Simon the Pharisees did not realize that whatever he said, if he knew who the master teacher was, if he knew Jesus was God, that he, if he knew that Jesus was truly a prophet, which he says if this man was a prophet, he would know the kind of woman who's touching him. She's a sinner. Jesus not only knew the heart of the woman, he knew the disposition of Simon. Typical of a, of a Pharisee, Simon views himself as maintaining a special level of righteousness even above the Lord himself. And he does not see this sinful woman as Jesus sees her. Simon, sees the Pharisee, Simon the Pharisee sees the woman as she had been and Jesus sees the potential for what she can become. Jesus knows that her humble, loving, contrite heart is ready for salvation. Simon will now learn that Jesus is from God and also a prophet because, again, Jesus knew Simon and his thoughts. And Jesus also knew the woman's spirit, her character, and her past sinful actions. And Jesus now has something to say, and Simon is ready to listen to the Master. Jesus tells a par parable of two debtors. One owes 500 denarii. Now if you take a day's wage, $15 an hour times 8 times 500, that's $60,000. And then the other owed 50, which is about $6,000. And they had nothing with which to pay, pay, repay the debt, and the creditor, creditor forgives them both. And Jesus asked Simon, which of them will love the creditor more? And S Simon supposes the one who had the bigger debt canceled. And Jesus commends Simon for his correct answer. And now Jesus will make his point. And here it is. Jesus, again, cares for both Simon and the woman. But while Simon is filled with pride... And self-righteousness, the woman is expressing faith, love, and humility, as well as fulfilling the hospitality to a guest that Simon should have fulfilled. We have to really watch it, brethren, in regard to our attitude toward people. We need to make sure our hearts are right before God. And again, have that love for the souls of people. We need to be like Jesus in this regard. He loved them both. But he saw the hypocrisy in Simon and he saw the, the faith and love and humility in the woman. We can judge people by their actions, but we have to be careful 
that we're not hypocrite, do not have hypocritical and hypercritical judgment toward people. And Jesus said, You didn't, Simon, you didn't give me the courtesy of water to wash my feet, which that was the hospitality that should have been extended. Or olive oil to anoint my head, but the woman washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. She kissed my feet and anointed my feet with expensive perfume. And all this shows is this woman that Simon viewed as a sinner showed every courtesy and every kindness that Simon did not show to Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. So the self-righteous Pharisee did not think he was sinful, as sinful as the woman and would presume that he was in better standing with the creditor, God. And it was the other way around. Jesus forgives sinners. Let's pick up at verse 47. Therefore I say to you, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, notice, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So Jesus says to Simon that the woman's sins which are many are forgiven. And Jesus knows the penitent and humble spirit of the woman who's ready for forgiveness. And Jesus also knows she's full of faith. And we know faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And this woman's loving much is the result of our great faith in Jesus that he will provide for her in regard to her spiritual needs, including forgiveness of sins. But to whom little is given, the same loves little, is a warning to Simon, who, like other Pharisees, is self-righteous and prideful. He feels there is little sin in his life, especially compared to the sinful woman. And we have to watch it too. Do we compare ourselves with other people? Or do we compare ourselves to God's divine will and constantly study it every day? Examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith. If we're right with God. Are we removing the plank, or some version says the log in our eye, that we may be able to go and get the speck out of other people's eyes. We need to make sure that we're right with God. And the way we do that is compare our lives with his word. You see, this man has little appreciation for God's kindness, mercy, and grace exhibited in forgiveness. And Jesus says to the woman, what? Your sins are forgiven. What wonderful acknowledgement of her humble and contrite spirit and her works worthy of repentance. Those who sat at the table with Jesus began to say within themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Sadly, those who make such a statement are not even at the edge of salvation because of their self-righteousness and hypocrisy. They know that the one who forgives sins is God. And we live in a world like that, ladies and gentlemen. We live in a world that will say, yes, God forgives sins. But they reject the very message that Jesus gave in regard to how they can have their sins washed away. Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's Jesus' words. And what we have to do is say, he's the king. He's the one that can tell me what to do because he is the creator of the universe. And what we need to do is listen and obey. Bach notes, the stakes have risen. Either Jesus is a significant figure commissioned by God for his task or else he is extremely deluded, presumptuous, even blasphemous. 
And he goes on to say there is no middle ground. So Jesus publicly says, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So Jesus knows this woman's heart, her faith, and her trust in his mercy and pardon. And Jesus ends by telling the woman to go with the peace of God. And peace with God comes with freedom of sin. And that brings peace within. Ethelgard Smith concludes, For his part, Jesus cut through all the social and cultural conditions. It didn't matter to him whether he was ministering to a Gentile, a widow, or even a prostitute. Jesus saw people as individual souls, wholly apart from their backgrounds and outer trappings. And he met them at the point of their need. If they needed healing, he healed them. If they, if they needed encouraging, he encouraged them. If, he needed, if they needed forgiveness, he forgave them. I want to leave you with three admonitions. Number one, strive to see people as Jesus sees them. You've got to really think and, and contemplate on that one. Do we really look at people like that? You. You. Have a precious soul. You have a precious soul. You have a precious soul. You have a precious soul. Is that how we view people? As precious souls? That we want to help go to heaven? Number two, show loving kindness to all people. Let me ask you the question. When you leave tonight, and if many of you will go to restaurants to eat, how are you going to treat the wait staff? Are you going to let your light shine and treat them with kindness and consideration and show them what it means to be a Christian? Or are we going to be demanding and sometimes even ugly? That's where the rubber meets the road. How are we going to do tonight when we go out there and we deal with people in this world? And it needs to be with kindness. And then finally, love Jesus enough to bravely come to him. My mother was, she was a fascinating woman. I was telling some people today that she had five boys and a daughter. And I can assure you she was rougher on the five boys than she was the daughter. But she had no tolerance. For, for whining. And so if we, any of us, we, if we complain for, profusely, she had a lot of sayings that she used. <coughs> one, one of my favorites is she said, poor, poor, pitiful me, I'll just go eat a can of worms. <laughs> and then sometimes she'd just shorten it and say, wang. <laughs> and then my favorite to the grandkids, and Michelle can tell you this, if they whine, she'd say, get out the crying towel. And that same woman had so much kindness to people. She wanted us boys to be men. She wanted us to also be kind. And she manifested that in her life. She died in 2021. And I don't know how I got to my, through my section of the funeral. I was w more worried about me than Reagan, who preached the main part of the funeral. And what a tribute to her. She was an encourager. And we need to be better about that. Are we cur encouraging old people? She was in a memory care unit uh, a week before she died, and a nurse was so touched how sweet mother was to her. She sent us a video of it. And Mother was just being kind. And so she said, you're so beautiful. You're so kind to me. All those words that make a difference to people's lives. And I sat in the funeral. After I talked about all the things I liked about my mother. I want to be like that. I don't want to grow old and become bitter. I want to be kind and considerate to the day I die.
just like my mama. But what made her life so special is she did all that by being a Christian, being in Christ with us. And if you're not a Christian, I've already told you, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Will you come while together we stand and sing?